So why did we revisit the idea of interfaces? Like I said, there's two ways of implementing a thread or creating a threaded application, I should say. And one is to implement the runnable interface. The runnable interface creates a superstructure, makes sure that your class can be held within a thread. Let's go ahead and demonstrate that. We're going to create an application that lets us launch multiple threads. So class, oopsie, class my task implements runnable with two ends. We're not going to do anything else with the cat and the dog, so whatever. You can delete them or whatever. Leave them there. And every runnable has to have, and if we go ahead and click on the little arrow over here, it tells us what we have to have. Implement all abstract methods. We have to have a run method. Because that, when the thread starts, it will execute my class's run method. Whatever I want it to do. We're going to make it do something pretty simple, like print a message. System.out.println thread running. Right. Now when you create a thread, you give it a name. And so we could get the name out of this thread if we so chose. Let's do that. So string name equals thread dot, that was capital T, current thread with another capital T, parentheses and parentheses, dot, Get name, capital N. And then we could just print that out, right? Running. Or how about name plus quote space is running. All right. So that's our thread. We're going to modify it so it does something a little bit cooler than that, but it's enough for now. And in Lecture X, in the main, I don't really care about the kitties, we understand that concept. We're going to make the thread, my task, mt1 equals new, my task. Now we're going to launch it. So to hold that task, we have to create a thread. Thread, oopsie, where am I typing? Certainly not here. Thread T1 equals new thread. And we're going to specify what the task is. Right, MT1. That's the, that, that's the task that this thread is going to use. Comma, and we have to give it a name. Like how about thread space end quote plus well let's create a counter variable that can hold you know how many variables we have going on uh, excuse me how many threads right so int i equals one put that there so that we can then add thread space end quote plus i how about i plus plus Why do I want to do that? Just to increase i after each time that gets executed. Well, it's only going to get executed once at this point. Well, I'm going to leave it there anyways, and we'll come up with a good reason for that being there. All right, so when I run it, it's not going to do anything really impressive. Yet, we have not started the thread. We created the thread, but until we call this dot start method, it doesn't do anything t1.start t1.start parentheses and parentheses semicolon all right now when it starts it's going to execute the body of our thread the run method of our runnable thread we don't implement a start method Start is already part of the thread class. 
but what the start method in the thread class does is it invokes the mandatory, mandatory run method from the interface. So when I ran it, we should have gotten a message. Thread one is running. Yeah, well and good. Let's make it pause a certain amount of time before the thread returns. What do I mean by that? We might want to thread dot sleep, something like that. So what I'm thinking is making this guy sleep for a certain amount of time. Let's define that time up here as a member of the method. Public int sleeps equals five. I want him to sleep five seconds. And so here I'm going to say after the name plus is running, we're going to call thread.sleep. What that does is it just puts the thread to sleep for a certain amount of time. It's in milliseconds. So that would be for five milliseconds. If I want it to be for five seconds, I would make the sleep center for 5,000. And it's wanting some exception handling because the sleep method could cause an exception if the application is killed while sleep is running. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to say surround the block with try catch or surround the statement with try catch. Doesn't really matter which. Looks like I did block. What am I going to do? I could have just left the default handler. System.out.println in parentheses. We're never going to see this message, most likely. Maybe we will. But name plus quote was interrupted. End quote in parentheses semicolon. That'll only happen if the sleep method throws that exception. Oh, I forgot to get the name here. Better do that. I'm just going to copy that statement. Why don't we put it above the try? Just cut that. Paste it above the try. So we have string name equals thread.currentthread.getName on this line. We have our try block, which prints out a message and goes to sleep. And then after it sleeps for a while, we're going to say is done. So I'm going to copy that statement there. After sleep, I'm going to paste it and make it say is done, right? Is finished, whatever. And then that thread is done, right? So we can come down here. By the way, this is the end of our task class, end of my task class. Well, let's make another thread. It can use the same task. There's no reason to create a second task. I think that's true. Sure. Wouldn't be anything wrong with making a separate task for each one. Now that I think about it, since every task can have its own instance data, right, then we might want to have several different tasks. So I'm going to come down here and I'm just going to copy this stuff right here. I'm going to copy all that and change all the ones to twos. Copy those three lines, paste them. MT2 equals new my task. Thread T2 equals new thread MT2. T2.start. Now maybe you see why I did the I++. So that the first thread will call itself one, but then I gets incremented, right? And then the next one will, you know, say that it is thread two. And after this, let's do a print message saying that the main is done, right? System.out.print ln parentheses quote main is done, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. All right, we're ready to go. We're going to watch each one of them pause for five seconds, if we are correct. Right, thread one, two is running, thread one is running. You may think it's funny that they occurred in the opposite order. It waited five seconds, 
and then thread one was finished and thread two was finished. Since it's a multi-threaded application and these things were launched at about the same time, you know, it was, you know, 50-50 as to which one was going to get its message in first because these things are running so fast. If we really wanted one to print its message out before thread two, we might put a little bit of a pause between them, right? You know, a 100 millisecond pause, right? A tenth of a second before launching T1 and T2. And we could do that right here in main. But notice it said that main is done even before the threads started doing anything, right? We're not used to that. We're not used to main being finished before the program is done. And in this case it is. Because these separate processes, these separate threads, and I'm calling them processes because you've probably heard the term before, but a thread is a way to implement a multi-processing application, but a process is actually something different. A process is, is a part of an application, excuse me, part of a, your operating system. Like if you launch Task Manager in Windows, you can list all your processes, right? And so each application has its own process. So all the, those are all the processes my, that my uh, that Windows has currently got running. Each one of these is probably multi-threaded. I would expect so. And I can't get in and I can't see the individual threads, but I can certainly see the multiple processes. All the processes are sharing the time on the computer. If you had a single core computer, then only one process could be running at a time. But nowadays all processes are multi-core pretty much. So like if you have a four core chip, then it could be running four processes at the same time. Time. It does this via a mechanism known as task switching. If we pretend that my computer only had one core, then it could only run, run one process and then it would switch over to the other one and it would let that one run for a little bit of time and then it'd switch over to another one and let it run for a little bit of time, right? And then eventually it would switch back to the first one. And if one of them had more priority, it would switch to that one more often and to one of the processes with least priority. So that's operating system stuff, not threading stuff, but it works kind of the same way. We have multiple threads running at the same time in our application. And since we have these multi-threaded processors, that's legal. These things are actually probably running at the same time. Or they could be task switching to some extent. Now one of the problems about running multiple threads is that if you have multiple threads accessing the piece, same piece of data, that data can get corrupted. It's like if you have a pie and you have two people, or okay, let's give another example. Um, say you have a piece of, of rock and two sculptors are working on it at the same time. Now really only one sculptor should be banging away on that piece of rock at a time. The other one should be waiting for the first one to get done. Right, or they should be trading blows or something like that. You know, they both better not be chiseling on the rock at the exact same time, or you know, they, they may crack the rock, something like that. Or if you have two people hammering at a nail, if both hammers hit the nail at the same time, the uh, carpenters that are swinging those hammers aren't gonna like the results. So what you can do is you can lock that resource. You can lock that variable so while that one thread is using it. But back to the idea that main was done before these tasks were finished. What if you don't want that to be the case? Well, you can tell main that I want you to wait until that thread is actually done before your print main is done. And so you have a t1.start and a t2.start, but if you say t1.join, parentheses and parentheses, and t2.join, parentheses and parentheses, or not, Oh, okay, it wants some exceptions handled. Anyways, the join command tells it to wait until finish T1, until thread T1 is done. Right, it's kind of a pause and wait for that thread to finish. And it's also gonna pause and wait until that thread is finished. Now if that thread is already finished, right, if T2 is already well and done by the time that T1 lets it go to the next one, all well and good, right, it'll just skip that statement, keep going up mer merrily on its way. Let's implement a try-catch for these. So I'm going to come up here and add 
surround the statement with try catch, right? But I'm going to put t2.join in the same place. And I could put a print message here just saying that the threads were interrupted. System.out.println parentheses, right? One or more threads interrupted. Now, why can those things throw an interrupted exception? Because if we come up here and look, that's what this guy can generate. Now, honestly, since it's caught here, we're probably not going to ever see this happen down here. Let's run it and see if we can kill it. And, well, let, let's run it and watch to make sure the main is done. does not show up until the threads are actually done. All right, so they're both waiting their five seconds. This time, thread one got out of the gate a little bit faster. And then thread one finished, thread two is finished, and then it said main is done. So it waited. The join calls told it to wait until those threads were done before it could get down here and say main is done. Now that's not handling the locked resource yet. But we could make each thread use a common resource. It could be a static variable, a static variable implemented, you know, somewhere else. It could be some data, you know, that was passed into both of them. I think the easiest thing to do might just be to make a static variable of lecture X that both of them is going to modify for whatever purposes, right? Public static void number equals zero, right? Except it's not a void number, is it? It's an int number. And each one of these is supposed to int add one to number. So right before it goes to sleep, in our task, we're going to add one to this static variable. So lecture x dot number. Lecture x dot number plus plus. Now, if we tried real hard and created hundreds of threads and let them go, we could probably get it so that that piece of data was corrupted. And it's just because you have multiple things trying to access the same bytes at the same time. It's a four byte data value, and one of them is changing one of those bytes, and another one is changing a different one of those bytes, and then it can mess it up. The data could become corrupted. So we would want to lock it. Let's make sure I haven't broken it first, though, right? Seems to be working. We can print out lecture.x.number after we were all done. All right. It'd be fun to put this in a loop so that it created a whole bunch of threads. We could store all those in an array list. And then we could call dot join on everything in the array list. I think that's that's trying a little bit too hard, so I'm not going to bother actually trying to demonstrate data corruption. But we may as well print out number, right? So down here, down in main is done, main is done, comma, static number, space equals, end quote, plus number, right? And it should equal to. I think, because this adds the task each time it's run, adds one to that value, and we create two threads. So two things adding to it. Should let that value be a two when it's done. All right. So we wait our five seconds. Eventually, it's going to print it's done, and that number is equal to two. Like I said, it would be fun to create 10,000 of these guys and see if we could ever get that piece of data corrupted. Why don't we? just for funsies. We don't even have to call dot join on them all for this experiment. So four parentheses and i equals zero, semicolon, i is, wait, we've already got a variable called i. So four, and i was two at this time. Let's not even initialize i, right? 
we're just going to keep doing this until i is no longer less than 10,000, semicolon i plus plus. And I forgot my semicolon. I said it, and I didn't type it. All right. So thread tt equals new thread, but we have to create our new task. All right. So my task mt equals new my task parentheses in parentheses thread tt equals new thread. I'm going to pass in my task as the first argument, and the name of the thread is just going to be loop thread space end quote plus i. And then it's going to run itself. tt dot start parentheses in parentheses. You'd think it'd be dot run since you implemented the method run, but you implemented it as part of the task, not of the thread. So there is not no dot run there. And if you call it MT dot run, it would just run it as though it were synchronous, you know, a single threaded thing. It would go up there and it would run that run method without actually launching it as its own thread. All right, so we're gonna have 10,000 threads going. Oh, no wonder. That's where my semicolon went. I accidentally typed in L there. And they're all, and eventually we'll print name is equal to done. It's really too bad that we don't have a way to join and wait for them to all be finished. I'm just gonna thread sleep for about 30 seconds. Give all these things time to finish. I hope they do. And again, thread sleep can throw an exception. So surround the statement with try catch. I'm just going to leave the default handler there. All right, who cares? All right. That's probably going to take more than 30 seconds for these 10,000 threads to actually finish because we're going to get 10, um, we're going to get 10,000 different lines of data printed. Which is going to take a long time. Well, let's just see what happens. And see, there they go, right? All 10,000 are done, or sent off. <laughs> and then they all, 10,000 finished. Isn't that pretty neat they can get 10,000 different things running at the same time? And really, they all executed at about the same time. You know, we could start a measurement and an end measurement and print out, you know, exactly how many milliseconds it took for them to all run. I don't see my done message yet. But whatever, I'm gonna stop trying to demonstrate the corruption and I'm just gonna delete all the code that I just typed. Not really germane to the, to the point. All right. Okay, so how do we make it so that number is protected so that it gets locked and unlocked. Only one thread can access it at the same time. All right, so our problem is that multiple threads are making changes to number. A couple of things you should do. And there's all sorts of ways that you can make this so-called thread safe. And if you need to make something thread safe, if you have multiple threads that are not modifying the same piece of data, then what you're going to want to do is to Google ThreadSafe Java, ThreadSafe Java, you know, or ThreadSafe Java space fields, ThreadSafe Java variables. You'll go and look that up in order to learn all sorts of different ways of doing it. One thing we want to do is to add the keyword volatile, volatile there. What does volatile do? Let's Google it up. Volatile Java. The volatile keyword in Java. Use volatile is a way to make class thread safe. Thread safe means that methods or classes can be used by multiple threads. 
in the same time without any problem. So suppose the two threads are working on a shared object. If the threads run on different processes, each thread processors, right, you have a multi-core processor, each thread may have its own local copy of shared variable. Shared variable, shared variable. If you mark something as volatile, it means I'm not seeing a great description here. Um, what it means is that if something makes a change to it, everything else will get the freshest, newest version right then and there. So that, that goes a good long way. So, okay, here it is. Changes made by one thread are visible to the other threads immediately. So that's a start, but it's not the only way to do it. You can use a lock that locks down that thing. What if you needed to do several things to that variable rather than just one? Oh, by the way, did I just see reference to a synchronized keyword like that? That would do what I'm about to say. No, not allowed there. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that volatile. What you do, is before the code that goes to change that piece of data, you add a synchronized call. Synchronized based on this object probably implies that the data should be a member of this class. I do believe that to be the case we should be locking on a reference to the class with when, within which that data is declared. So if I'd been thinking better, I would have made this a member of the my task method, right? But we could do that to sleeps, right? Say we were gonna modify sleeps. We're not, but say we were gonna then synchronizing on this would be a good thing to do. And so what you do is you say synchronize based on this and then you have a block of code here. Okay, having read a little bit more about it, the this reference here, this is actually the right way to do it because the method that's trying to change the data is part of this class. Don't know how I'm going to read a little more. All right, if I wanted to do this, what I would have needed to do would be to provide a method that could be invoked by a single object. If we had called several, if we had started several threads based on the same object, right? My task MT1 equals new my task, and then we started several threads based on the same object then the synchronized this would work just fine. However, that's not the case. We created a separate task object for every separate thread, so we don't have a single object upon which to lock. However, it's easy enough to fix that because you can also mark a method as synchronized. And if the method is synchronized, then what it means is that access to that method will be synchronized. Only one of those methods will be running at the same time. And again, you use a synchronized keyword. It just have, happens that the synchronized keyword can be used in different places, meaning different things. So I'm gonna unremove that synchronized keyword, right? And the block with which it's in. Now, if I added the synchronized keyword here, this is not correct. So if you're typing along, don't do it. Synchronized. If I added that there, and apparently I misspelled it, whatever, right? There we go then it would mean that the entire method was synchronized and the entire method would have to run from beginning to end. Let's prove that to myself, make sure that that's actually the case. But we don't want that because it's sleeping for five seconds right in the middle of all that. So when we run it, 
right? It's taking 10 seconds for it to finish rather than five. I believe that to be the case when I was counting it out. 1,000, one, two, three, four, thousand, five. No, it didn't. All right. But my understanding of it is that you should enter the synchronized block of code and exit it as soon as possible. So I would not want to put it on run. Instead, I would want to make a method that updated that. And that method would probably need, I mean, I could put it as part of the thread, or I could make it part of the lecture class, right? This thing doesn't have to be public. It's, it's kind of poor form, you know, to be making data public. One of our rules is data private. So we could make this private, and then down here we could add a increment method, right? So public synchronized increment number, parentheses and parentheses, and it just adds one to number. Apparently I have an error there. Oh, because I didn't give it a return type. Anyways, number plus plus. And it should be static, and it does need to be void. All right. So we're saying that access to this method is synchronized. No other thread will be able to call this. While the other one, all the other ones will be waiting for it to finish. Only one at a time can be marching through this function, this method. So let's come up here and replace this with a call to increment number, right? So lecture x dot increment number. Now we're good to go. We took two steps. We made this volatile, meaning that that data cannot be cached in memory by the separate threads. If it gets, you know, cached in memory, if each thread is storing a copy of that variable and hoping that the updates trickle to the, uh, all the separate memory areas at the same time, volatile says it no. Absolutely has to be published to all the copies of the data. And this means that only one access to it can be happening at a time. So it's doubly safe. Now this is a the somewhat expensive way of getting synchronization. Meaning that if you were in some code that needed to be run, you know, 10,000 times a second, you would want to look up a different way of doing synchronization using lock objects. But this is good enough. I think that this is a good enough concept. You know, we could put a print message saying system.out.println, parentheses, quote, you know, locking access to number and then unlocking access to number. Now, this is really isn't going to prove anything, but we absolutely should not see anything that says locking access to, well, we could put a sleep in it, right? And then unlocking access to number. Yeah, let's put a thread sleep here. Thread dot sleep, parentheses in parentheses. Let's make it wait a second. Oh, and it wants its good old try catch block. All right. I'm just going to do, yeah, surround the block with try catch. I'm not going to even bother changing the default handler for the exception. Whatever NetBeans gave is it good enough for me. We're not going to even just delete it, right? Okay, so there we go. When it runs, we should see it say, locking access to number. It waits a second, and then it says unlocking access to number. Locking, unlocking, locking, unlocking. We will never see an instance when it, we see two locking in a row, or two unlockings in a row. We could be passing the thread name into the increment function. Right, so that we can see string name, right, and then print line name plus quote space, right, and then name plus quote space. And since we modified the signature of that method, we modified a hits header, we have to go in and pass in the thread name when we call increment number. 
fortunately that's flagged as an error now, right? So we're just going to pass in the name. So when we run it, we see that thread 2 locked it first, then it unlocked it, and then thread 1 locked it, and then unlocked it. So only one thread was able to get in there at a time. And there was just a crapshoot as to which one, you know, got to do it first. Since the threads are being launched almost simultaneously, as far as the computer is concerned, then uh, which one got to it first, you know, is essentially random. If we put some, some kind of pause between the launching of those threads, then we would see the first one always get to it first. So down here in main, we could have put a thread sleep here. Thread dot sleep, you know, 100 milliseconds between the creation of the two. And then we should always see, oh, once it's dry catch, we'll forget it, I'm not gonna do that. All right. Hope that was educational. Seems like there's a warning over here. Warning. Configure thread sleep and synchronize context. Hint. Thread dot sleep call and synchronized context. Oh, well, that's a very good error. Or warning. What it's telling us is you idiot, you put a sleep in something that's synchronized, meaning that whatever's waiting for it next has to wait for that sleep to be done, which is stupid. Now, in this case, we wanted it intentionally. We wanted it to sleep to illustrate that access to it was synchronized. But normally, you don't want the threads that are all lined up trying to call that method to have to wait for a dumb old sleep to occur before the next one can get through. Just like if you're passing you know, people through a turnstile, you would not want to make each person who was passing through the turnstile stop and stand there for a certain amount of time before they got through. All right, hope that was educational. And as a byproduct, we saw some examples of exceptions that had to be caught. The real important concept here was how to create a thread class. Well, how to create a runnable, an object that implements runnable. So we illustrated the concept of interfaces and implementing. Once you have one of these classes that implements runnable, you can create an object of that type like we did here. Once you create an object of that type, then you can launch it into a thread constructor, passing that object in, passing that reference in. And then you call the start method. And if you need your application to wait until that thread is finished, then you call dot join. I'm not sure why they call it dot join. They could have called it like dot wait or dot finished or something like that, but whatever, dot join. The other way to create multi-threaded applications would be to inherit from, to extend the thread class. If I come over here, you know, Java thread extend, right? So you can extend the thread class. Advantages of each. If you extend the thread class to accommodate your multi-threading application, you cannot extend another class due to the Java specification that your one class can only inherit from one. The task and the runner are highly tightly coupled. No code reusability other than copying and pasting. Overhead of an additional method. Maintenance of code not easy. Okay, well I believe all that even if I can't quite explain why the task and the runner are tightly coupled. If you implement it as a runnable interface, you can extend another class. The task and the runner are loosely coupled. Gives better code reusability. All right, now I would need to read up to be able to argue these two through five points. But I certainly can argue this. Wonder why it thinks the implementation, the code, is easier to understand.
the second difference between extends and threads in implementing is that using a runnable instance to encapsulate code, which should run in parallel, provides better reusability. You can pass that runnable to any other thread or thread pool. Well, okay. I'm getting it now. I'm getting it now. Since in our code, no, we don't want Visual Studio. We don't want to have to rewrite the thread class to accomplish our goal. So instead, we can just write a my task class, which is itty bitty and small, and can be passed into the thread class to do its work. That's how I'm taking it. All right. Like I said, I hope this is educational. And we will be looking forward to the next lecture, which is writing two J frames that launching two J frames, launching one J frame from another, letting that J frame, the second one, modify data that the first one then has access to. So let's stop here.